Uh, good evening. My name is Richard Church. On behalf of the Baltimore Washington Conference Native American Ministries Committee, I'm pleased to welcome you to our webinar tonight. For our program, we'll be using a webinar format. So you will be able to, uh, to see and hear our presenters, but we will not have the ability to open uh, to uh, the ability for open group discussion with all participants. We will use the chat function to provide everyone with the ability to submit questions during the program. We will gather and sort your questions and direct them to one of the speakers at the appropriate time. If we run short of time for questions during our webinar, we will provide written responses to the questions. When you submit a question, please include your name to assist us in getting the response back to you. We will provide additional resource materials or references on our website for you to explore information related to our topics. Uh, our address, and we'll post that address later and it's on, our, uh, on the website, but a direct uh, uh, connection would be bwcumc.org forward slash NAM. And don't worry if you didn't quite catch that because it will be posted again. First, I'd like to uh, introduce our planning committee for the, you know, for the webinar. Uh, you have met me, Richard Church, and uh, the next, uh, next person is Jill Meisch, Walter Jackson, Reverend Stacy Cole Wilson, and Reverend Neil Christie. Now you may not be able to see them, but uh, just imagine they're all jumping up and down and waving hello to, to each of you. We're so glad that you're able to join us. Our uh, first topic tonight will be uh, murdered and, well, uh, murdered and missing women and girls. Every year, indigenous women experience sexual assault and violence at an alarming rate, well above national averages. In contrast to COVID-19, where families and communities must deal with the loss of loved ones from a virus, they're also confronted with the trauma and loss from violence. In far too many cases, families are faced with not knowing what has happened to their loved ones and the trauma of feeling that no one cares. Reggie Rain will guide us to raise our awareness and understanding to this issue and share resources so that we can learn more and become in, in more involved. She is the chairperson of the Peninsula Delaware Conference, United Methodist Church Committee on Native American Ministries and chairperson of the Native American International Caucus. Our second topic will be a discussion of the impact of COVID-19 on Native American communities. We've all been challenged with COVID-19 in our lives throughout this past year. Native American communities have been, been impacted to a greater extent than the general population. While Native Americans have some unique environmental, economic, and cultural challenges, our focus will be on the family and community impacts of COVID-19 rather than a discussion of case numbers or statistics. Dr. Casey Church will guide us in this discussion. He is pastor of Good Medicine Way, a contextual ministry with Native Americans in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He is a scholar, educator, but more importantly, he is a pastor who faces the impact of COVID-19 with his own family, as well as with the families in his community. He has extensive contact with Native American leaders and communities across the country and can share additional insights. We are most honored to have these outstanding guest leaders with for our discussions on these critically important topics this evening. During our 90 minutes together, we'll divide our program into three segments. After the first two segments that I have described, we'll return and continue with additional discussion around ministries to support 
uh, ministries of support for families and communities impacted by these tragedies and respond to questions submitted by our attendees. At this, uh, at this point, I'd like to have you just wherever you are, uh, just bow your heads and we'll have a brief uh, blessing as we begin our work. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we are able to be together to share the knowledge with one another of some you know, just the most, some very important topics that have had a devastating impact on individuals, our families, and our communities. We ask that you bless our, our leaders and those that are sharing their information with us, that it will be the right information for each of us so that we will be much better prepared to, to serve you and our communities and other communities around the country, wherever we are able to. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And at this point, I will turn the, uh, uh, the, the, the podium over to Raggy Rain. Is uh, Reggie on mute? Um, I'm getting off mute right now, but it won't let me open my camera. I don't know why, I'm sorry. Okay. Osios, Skadoogies. It's so wonderful to be here with you tonight. We're going to share just a little bit about missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. So let us begin with the beginning. We do not speak for all Indigenous human beings. We are going to share with you the knowledge that has been spoken to us and the wisdom that we hope carries on throughout this night and along with you as you begin to journey this journey with us. When we look at two things that you often see is that we're hanging red dresses or we're dressed in red. And one of those reasons is for many tribes, but not all tribes, we believe that when our people have walked on, that the only color they still recognize is the color red. And so we wear the red so that they can recognize us and we can bring their spirits back home and do in the way that we have been taught the traditional way to bring them home and give them peace. You also notice that often that we will have our women and young girls will be wearing a red handprint against their face, across their mouth. This is very important because it represents the violence that was committed against our young women and girls and that they were forcibly silenced. That image should burn a hole in each of us to remind us of what is going on. And they can no longer speak for themselves. So it now becomes our responsibility to speak. I wanted to tell you that at this moment, we're gonna take one small step forward. And so if you can't see it, but I have a business card in my hand and on this business card, there's an acronym and it's M-M-I-W-G. And underneath it's spelled out, Missing Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. And then the handprint is on there. When you flip this card over, you will see there are three facts that are related to this. And then you'll see a website underneath it. And below that, one thing you can do 
So this tiny step that you can do is have business cards made with the information that you want to share and carry them with you everywhere and then purchase the t-shirts. And why do you need to purchase the t-shirts? Because you want to wear them to educate and bring awareness. And when they ask you about your t-shirt, you can share with them and then you can hand them the card and you can say, here is information you can carry home and share with your friends, your relatives, and others. It seems so simple, but it's so important because this is a way they carry away your words and to help you make a difference. So that's one tiny step. Now we're going to begin your second step. As I walk those familiar steps, the sun is shining brightly, but I walk in complete fog. I will not, I cannot allow the light back into my life. As I climb the steps, I put my hand on that well-worn doorknob and I start to turn it and I stop. I do not want to go inside. Instead, I want to turn and I want to run until I can't run any longer and I collapse. Our child has died. And no amount of begging and praying will bring my child back into my arms. But I know the right thing to do. So I take the doorknob and I turn it. And I step into a home that has memories of four beautiful children. And harsh reality slaps me in my face. For I remember there are only three now. Even though their presence is all around me, it isn't enough. I cannot embrace them. I cannot hear their voice any longer. And I break. I remember that exact moment as though it is happening right now. That Saturday morning when the phone rang and the unimaginable words spoken from the other side and they said, your child has died. I dropped the phone and the screams welled up inside of me and flowed out like a mighty river. I could not stop screaming, and I ran outside. My screams were so loud, the trees bent and wept for me. And then from the corner of my eye, I saw my father coming towards me. Perhaps he could turn back time. Perhaps he could help me in some way. But instead, he motioned for the children to go inside. And then he turned and he walked away. And I was alone. I was all alone. And I would continue to be alone. I remember and have stitched it onto my heart the struggles to bring our child back home. And then we prepared their body in the way that our ancestors taught us and covered them in that giveaway blanket and sent them on to be with Gichi Manitou. 
And as we sit there and watch them lower our child into the earth, my sobs were uncontrollable. And I felt the screams wailing up inside. And I knew the river was ready to flood out. And my sister grabbed me and said, no, no, for the children's sake, no screaming. And I stuffed it back inside of me. And that is where it still lives today. Many, many months have gone on. Every morning I wake up and I prepare to go about my daily work. And before I walk out the door, I slip the mask upon my face and I hide from the rest of the world. And when I return home, I feed the children and slip the mask off and I sit down in the chair. I remember when I had smashed all of our dishes against the wall, I am no longer smashing dishes, for I have broken everything in our house. I believed if I smashed enough around me that somehow it would ease my pain, but it did not. So I pull my grief around me like a shawl and I hide from the world for no one understands the sorrow a mother feels when her child is taken away. But on this night, my little boy runs in and I look up and our eyes meet. His eyes are filled with tears his bottom lip is quivering. I want to embrace him and tell him it will be okay, but I cannot. He looks at his father and he says, when is my mommy coming home? When is my mommy coming back? And his father said, your mother's right there. And his cries began, that's not my mommy. That's not my mommy. I want my mommy back. And he runs from the room. I want to chase after him. I want to embrace him and tell him it will be okay. But I cannot. For I am paralyzed in grief. A small step forward is for each of us to embrace the families that are struggling, the families that are so frozen in grief, and accept them and their words for where they are. And understand this is a lifelong journey. There are families, mothers and sisters and brothers and husbands and fathers searching for their children. They can do nothing because that's all they can think about. How can we, the people, how can we, the United Methodist Church, we have to ask, we have to ask, how can we help them? Not give them the phrases that people say at funeral services. Really listen to them. If you have a family that is searching in your community or a community you know about, Know that as they search, they are not working. How can they keep a home for their families when they're not working, when they're searching? 
15? How can they put gas in the car? How do they make the flyers that they are hanging, asking people to help? How do they feed their children? These are things that we can do to be of service. You may say, Reggie, how long will we have to do it? We will have to do it a long time. And I remember during that time that my little boy was at the community bus stop waiting for me to pick him up. I love him, but I was so consumed. I forgot him. And somebody had so much compassion, they brought him to me and told me it wasn't my fault. Well, I still felt like it was my fault, but I didn't lose him too. How can we help the families? How can we help our children? I want you to think about the children. When Christmas comes, will the family be able to lift a tree into the house? Will they be able to give gifts? Or are they consumed also? And these are the things they can't do. How can we be there for them? And if it's not in our own communities, how can we find about families that need us, human beings, to put their hands out and ask no questions, but give from the heart. There is much legislation that is out there right now, and it is very, very important that we all educate ourselves and begin to speak and talk and share with others and to call anybody and everybody, governors, senators, representatives, this is important to be out in the marches, show that you care, write those letters, get others to help. But tonight, I'm not going to talk about that legislation. I'm going to ask you questions, and you can't answer me, so I'm going to answer them for you. <laughs> when you hear the word racism, what comes to your mind? How many of us, when we hear the word racism, does the word Native Americans come to mind? Not often, because we are the invisible ones. I do not know how many of you watched election night, but my daughters and I, we watched election night with our friends. And on election night 2020, CNN was breaking down the votes. This is very important. And the first one they had up there was white, Latino, black, something else in Asian. When we saw that, we were called something else for generation after generation, we have been called other. How hard is it? to write indigenous. How hard is it to say Native Americans, American Indians? Why would you call us something else in 2020? When did this happen and why did it happen? Perhaps the truth is we should all know our history. And we should know it well, because when we know our history, 
then we have an understanding of what still is going on today. So I'm going to move through it quickly. October 11th, 1492, Christopher Columbus without a compass sailed the oceans blue. Native Americans discovered him lost at sea and welcomed him and the crew in. There was more than enough for everyone. They had fresh water and food and a place to rest their weary bodies. But as they looked around, they decided there wasn't enough for everyone. And it began then. The enslavery of our people for more than 225 years. The kidnapping, the rape, and the murders and taking them from their homelands to some place else because they did not see us as human beings. In some parts of the United States, slavery lasted for 225 years and other parts of America, it lasted 371 years for our people. The 4th of July comes and there's so much celebration from 1776. And that first line, it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. How many of us know that? How many of us know that? But if you look down a few lines, maybe 30 lines later, you will see words that perhaps you haven't seen. It says the merciless Indian savages whose known role of where were found. This is not a mistake and this wasn't done lightly. This was in purpose that they would declare that we were merciless Indian savages. Until the doctrine of discovery was mentioned and it all began, my friends. It all began. 1824. Native Americans became the word of the United States, which meant they could tell us what to do. No matter what, we had to do what they said. They removed it from our home. Casey's there. <laughs> so we're looking at everything that began to happen. In 1864, teaching children that they were not to speak their tribal language. The Sand Creek Massacre, 1864. We know about the Sand Creek Massacre because it's connected to us, the United Methodist Church. It wasn't until March 12, 1880, that a judge put down his hammer and said, today we declare that Native Americans are indeed human beings. Until then, they deb debated whether we were animals or human. It took a judge to decide that. I want you to know that this has followed us throughout history. Forbidding tribal religion and culture. And it's still happening in 2020. Why do our women disappear? Let us look at it. What is happening in Indian country? What is happening to the resources that are on homelands and reservations and how they're being utilized by someone else? And Native people are not receiving benefits from that. How they bring in man camps 
and in the man camps. Tribal police have no authority over them. And often there are perpetrators in the camps who prey on women. I think about our education. Education is so important. One fact that we don't talk about is 79% of our teachers within the United States are white Americans. And you think, why is that? Why does that matter, Reggie? Let's think about it. Because 49% of the children in our schools are children of color. And they are being taught by somebody who could be well-educated and loving. But they are teaching from their own perspective. And they're expecting our children to understand and see it through their eyes. We live five miles from the ocean and six miles away from the ocean is a community and their children have never been to the ocean. These are important facts that we look at and we look at the system and Casey will talk about the health system what we look at this, that it wasn't until 1978 that the government stopped removing our children from our home because they saw it through their eyes, not through the eyes of our community. And during the time of the pandemic, we continued to hear intergenerational families, and it was spreading the virus. But when they said it, they said it like it was a bad thing. But in our people, our community, no, it is the most precious thing that we have in our generational families, growing together, being there with one another, being with one another in your tribe is so important. My hope is after tonight that you will educate yourself and look at the history and have a better understanding how this came to be. And the only way to end the racism is for us to face it. Look it in the eye and say no more and accept the responsibility for us to do it and us to educate others. Unless we do, this will continue to happen. And so I say, Nuskis Monika, I think my time is finished. Okay, thank you very much, Reggie. Uh, we especially thank you for uh, uh, sharing uh, your experience with us in a, in a very, very difficult subject. And, uh, and we sincerely hope, along with you and the others, that this will inspire us to learn more and to find out more information so that we can become more in involved with this. At this point in time, we'll, uh, we'll proceed on to the, our, uh, our next presenter, it's uh, Casey Church. Uh, I did uh, introduce Casey a few minutes ago, just before he was able to connect. And if uh, Casey's video link is not yet active, uh, Stacy, could you check to make sure that his video link is active? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, I see him there. So, Casey, we're uh, awfully glad to have you with us, and I'll turn this section over to you. Uh, since you're just connecting now, Casey, we uh, what I uh, described that we would divide our program into three sections. Uh, your your first section is the impact of COVID on Native American communities. And Raggy was talking about uh, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. And uh, since Raggy went first, uh, then you, know, you can continue with, with COVID. And if you wish, uh, at the time you uh, complete that section, 
uh, then you can proceed directly to talk about uh, about uh, meaningful ministries or ministries of support and how you work with communities in need. Because our communities are, are suffering greatly both from uh, uh, COVID as well as, well as violence and equally uh, in need uh, and uh, in need of our help. Okay, so Casey, I'll turn it over to you. And thank you, cuz. I don't know if everybody knew that this uh, Dick and I are first cousins. Oh. And uh, we go back a long ways to growing up together in a little church in, in Michigan. And his, uh, his dad was our, our pastor. Uh, it's great to be with you all. Um, my name is uh, Casey Church. And on the introduction that you've seen, is, uh, it was good, good and appropriate. And I'm just looking forward to, to sharing with you. Uh, I live here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And 21 years ago, uh, my wife and I uh, packed up from Michigan with our uh, then four children and one baby two months old. And we moved out here to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where my wife's family lives. And it, it was a, a planned move. Uh, we were married and we lived in Michigan for 10 years. And during that time, I started my education there. I uh, got a bachelor's degree in anthropology. And then I went on to seminary and at Grand Rapids Baptist Seminary. I uh, did some transferable credits and transferred to Fuller Theological Seminary, where I finished my master's and my doctorate. And from then on, it's been a, it's been quite a journey. So I in, have enjoyed every bit of it. The Lord has directed me in quite a quite a path of to change the direction of Native ministry. Then I'll talk a little bit about in the second section here. But uh, first of all, with the impact of uh, COVID on the Native American communities, especially the Native American communities out here in the Southwest. As you know, um, many times the, uh, the chairman of the Navajo Nation has been on TV, been sharing the plight, and I think you've heard about the, the, the many deaths and how it has impacted the, the reservation out here. And, you know, the reservation is, is so large, it's, it's bigger than some states back east, if you did not know, uh, you know about the size of uh, West Virginia, if you're, so it's a, it covers a lot of area. So I was able to contact three different folks that live on the reservation and get some information from them directly. Um, and then I'll also add our stories of how it impacted us here in Albuquerque, New Mexico in the urban setting. And Albuquerque is, uh, you know, right on the border of all the reservations that are close to us here. We have 19 Pueblos that run up and down the Rio Grande. And then uh, two hour drive away is then the start of the Navajo Reservation. Uh, in between there is a, a lot of desert if you haven't been out here. And uh, we're, uh, Bugs Bunny made us known for uh, Albuquerque back in the day. For those of you that remember Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck were traveling underground and they popped up and they said, uh, it looks like we made a wrong turn in Albuquerque. So it's, uh, it's okay to laugh and put a smile for your face on your chat there. But I was able to talk uh, with a young um, Navajo pastor who pastors what's called the Broken Arrow Bible Camp and Ranch out here just south of Gallup, New Mexico. Uh, he has uh, been uh, awarded and he's gone through a training that many of you uh, know that uh, through the, uh, the Van Endel uh, programs that they have in leadership. So Ty Platero, he you know, lives here in Al in the southwest here, by um, just south of Gallup, New Mexico, and he has a nice program. It's mostly what they do is during the summer they have youth programs that run all summer long for Navajo kids, and also for missionary kids that are coming in and want to learn a little bit about what uh, the Navajo Nation is about and get some. Uh, experience with that. But Ty, uh, during our conversation with him, I asked him three questions. 
three questions that were, uh, what was the impact on the Navajo Nation from your perspective? The other was, how did your ministry respond during that time? The third question was, how do you see in the future the healing that has to take place after COVID? And I talked to him a little bit about what kind of services possibly and what kind of ceremonies that we might have to partake in as we move forward. As uh, out here in Albuquerque right now, we're, we're, uh, we're green, but we also got another designation that's called turquoise. Yeah, kind of fitting for out this way. Turquoise is quite the popular stone and for jewelry and all those kind of things. But we, we've gone even up to another stage called turquoise. And uh, so masks are not required, but everybody's being very safe and cautious. So as I talked with Ty, and being a young minister, he, he's very talented. He and his wife, uh, uh, I found out during our conversation, will be expecting, they're like three months along with their first baby. So uh, that's that's scary in a way because she could have had COVID during that time and they really tried to stay safe. So those are some of the things that they really had to uh, lock themselves in, you know, stay away from uh, crowds and all. But it was hard, especially when you're a native ministry and you're working close to communities and if you don't know too much about <clears throat> the reservation life out here, it's very different than Baltimore and Washington. It's uh, very, very different. And when I make a trip back there to, to see Dick, I'm like a fish out of water in that big city there. Because out here, we live on a, a, a philosophy of manana. It's uh, if we don't get it to done today, there's always tomorrow. So we, we go slow, and if you know about our low riders, it's low and slow around here. So, But Ty was able to share with me some, some very interesting things that he uh, noted. He said that there was a unity that happened among the churches, that it, they were kind of forced into connecting with each other. Because of COVID, if, if you don't know, or heard on the, the radio and TV that the city of Gallup and the other small cities in, in the region there on the Navajo Reservation went into lockdown. So from Friday night sundown until Monday morning sun up, there was to be no entrance or exit from the, uh, the cities there. And because the, the cases and the deaths and the number of uh, were just skyrocketing around here, and they just not, could not control it. And people say, you, you wonder why it's such a, such a thing could happen in this area. Why, why is it so bad there? Uh, but as you get to know the situation in our area, you know that these families live in multi-generational families. Most of you probably that are listening here live with maybe one or two people in your house, maybe a child that they're still living at home. These, these households might run from six to 10 family members, and not all of them will be staying home. They'll be trying to go to work, and they'll try to work the fields and, and take care of the animals and visit people. And then when they come back, that's when the infections started taking place. Um, we have one, I'll tell a little story later, but we had one family member in our direct family who the son brought the uh, disease home to their home and infected his mother and his mother died here. And that was directly affected our family here in Albuquerque. And it's very tragic because you got to think about how that, that young person would react now and the heaviness that they would feel knowing that because of them not taking serious and being cautious brought COVID into their own home. But one thing he said, the denominations and even the inner tribal, they became more united because there was work to be done. Uh, we went through winter here. And if you're not allowed to go out, wood still has to be chopped and fire still has to be built and food still has to be delivered. And when you only have seven uh, supermarkets on the whole reservation, it's, that's really hard. 
There's small little communities that may have uh, uh, your little convenience stores, but supermarkets that you're used to are, are hard to find in the area. So <clears throat> a unique thing about the Navajo Nation here that he said that, uh, and we know personally because my wife and our family are Navajo out here, is that uh, uh, no one talks about the spiritual and mental side of death. It's just not a topic. In many families, you, you may know, and I imagine most of us on this webinar here come from a, an Anglo background. Uh, and that's not something of your culture that you would talk about. But the spiritual side here is that it, it's taboo. You don't talk about it, you don't bring it up, and when they do pass, you don't talk about the dead when they are passed. So there's lots of things that you have to learn when you live in this area and take seriously because they take them very seriously. Another thing he said is that there's, there's going to be a trauma. There's going to be this after COVID trauma that we're going to have to live with because it has interrupted so much of life. And as you know, there's going to be a PTSD effect that's going to have, take place. And he, he mentioned that. The, the overall effect, he says, of COVID, this, uh, starting with the police, one of the things that he said that was probably the most tragic for him is that they would find elders dead in their homes because they were unable to get food or water or fuel for their, their fires. So they would go to these homes and they would take time to go and search them and they would find elders uh, dead in their own homes. But there was some ins inspiring things, though, that happened, though. Uh, uh, a bad thing about his ministry that happened, though, because it is a summer camp, and the children and the youth, they really look forward to coming to his camp because it, it, it's such a great experience for them to go to the Broken Arrow Bible Ranch. They weren't able to meet, and it was 50 years before they had another lockdown like that where they had to close. So, so it disrupted their whole community there. But because of that, and they did have a staff and they did have some resources, they were able to supply some volunteers to the various communities. So they did go to houses and they did take uh, truck loads and trailer loads of wood. And then they would go to a house and then they would leave wood by the by the house no they didn't even have to ask you know they they just brought it to them and they says do you have enough wood for your fire and they would say no and they would leave them a, a good portion of wood so that they could stay warm they worked from two sites the the bible ranch and then they also worked from rehoboth and that's a, a was a, a long time uh, boarding school that was just to the east of gallup for a long time, Rehoboth Christian School has been out there. And they also worked with distributing food because I told you about the grocery stores and being closed. And if your, if your stores up there were, were ravaged by the, uh, those that wanted to stock up on toilet paper, uh, they had same thing happened out here. Uh, so the shelves went empty very fast and, they, and being way out here in the Southwest, they didn't fill up probably as fast as yours did either. So they would deliver food. <clears throat> he went into a little bit about the healing that has to take place because of COVID and after. He says, one thing that we got to think about is we cannot forget what COVID did. COVID brought death and you can you'll have to look at the statistics i'm not here to bring you statistics of any any nature to that i'm bringing you the personal effect that happened out here so lots of families lost family members and friends it, you could probably go to almost any person and they know somebody in their family that has died just like i mentioned ours and then we know who family members that have died so he said that um, kind of inspiring kind of thing that there's going to be uh, documentation. And he says, there's going to be a book written about this, this experience out here in the Southwest, because there was so much tragedy and so much loss and there's so much healing that needs to be done that someone is going to be pick, pick that up. 
he sees that happening kind of prophetically that there'll be a book to remember this time. <clears throat> One thing he thought about memorials and, and having services afterwards, it's kind of hard because like I said, they don't emphasize <clears throat> this death at all, but many of them uh, have, do believe that they should have funerals and since they did not have them during that time when the person passed, that he says afterwards, they'll probably be getting requests and he'll make it known that their, their ministry there can have a, a service of remembrance, a, remo a memorial for the person that had passed. So it, it's, it's life-changing things that happened around here and its life is very important. And people grieve in different ways. And we all know that. In our families, we know there'll there'll be one that is very quiet. We'll know that there's one that talks about it, and you don't see them, they can you can turn them off. And there's going to be some that'll go into depression, and there'll be some that will pick up the bottle and drink. And that's that's more possible out here. Uh, he, one thing that has happened out here, and I know has happened just from an, uh, watching uh, the Today Show here just recently, that. The number of people who took up drinking more during COVID increased greatly. And the same thing happened out here that drinking was became an extra problem. But how does the church going to grieve with them? He says, how, do, how are we going to be the portion of healing that's going to bring back to the people and bring some sort of balance? And you know that Native people, we try to live in this area of balance. Not too much one way or the other. You have to have a good uh, nature, a good harmony in yourself that the Navajo is called hojo. But the Natives believes, like I said, they don't talk about death. One uh, out of that conversation, and I'll talk a little bit later, is my ministry here in Albuquerque, we, we have a program on Monday nights on live stream. Our ministry is called Good Medicine Way, and I have invited Ty to talk about this, this topic and also talk about the topic of the ministries and the, the need for Native ministries in this area. The second person that I talked to is, was a white pastor. He and I have become friends over the years here. Uh, we've had many experiences together in camps that I promote across the country in Canada. His name is Rob McIntosh. He's the pastor of a church, a Navajo church in Church Rock, New Mexico. And it's just outside of Gallup to the east side. If you know the area, it's just past the casino. So there's not too many landmarks on that I-40 road, but if you, if the next road that you meet after the casino is Church Rock, and it's a little Navajo community. But Matt, Rob McIntosh and Michelle have been ministering there for many years now and have developed a lot of good relationships. But his, the reality that he said that happened there is that COVID has touched every family in his community everyone knows somebody that has died they just can't get away from it in his area too the alcohol use was on the rise again his the ptsd from isolation people were so scared um one of the things and i imagine dick understands this because navajos in the past were so afraid to go to the doctor that because uh most people waited too long to go to the doctor. So when they did go to the doctor or the hospital, they didn't return because they got worse and they died. And then so people were afraid to, to associate with doctors or hospitals. And that, that, that brought on death because they usually went in when it was way too late. Uh, one thing he says that um, people may growing grow in their faith but many blame god for what happened here and there's a very conservative branch of christianity that runs throughout the navajo nation and some of those are very heavy-handed and they you know some of the preaching and all of those things uh they ended up blaming god for what happened 
And so the people around the community also caught that spirit and said, well, if God had anything to do with this, I do not want to have anything to do with the church. So they, that is kind of keeping a boundary before people coming, coming to the church and coming to faith. One thing he said that he had to explain to me is that people died from fear of COVID. Most people died of this fear because they didn't understand it. There's a Navajo way of dealing with things that they, when things happen, they come together and they deal with it and they tackle it, any problem that comes their way. But this way, when this problem happened, you could not come together because if you came together, you spread the disease. So this was very uh, difficult for them to understand. So he says that that was a big part of it, is that they couldn't come and encourage each other. Uh, be, uh, they're like backies. Everyone, we're on this webinar. We're on a Zoom. We can get on Facebook. But when you're in an area where there's no, <laughs> there's no towers, there's no connection to the internet, there's no service, there's none of this social uh, life that you enjoy very well, there's... That way was not able to help them to engage even uh, socially by social media. So they didn't have that at all. The biggest thing he said that uh, there was no funerals. There was no time for mourning. And that was a big part. It, it causes a loss of hope in many of the people that he said. <clears throat> in my family here in Albuquerque, we didn't have the time to do a funeral. The, the auntie that died, died in the UNM hospital here, just down the road from me right here. And my wife and my mother-in-law were able to be there af just shortly after the death and be with the body and pray over them because they, they, they beg them, they tag them and beg them, and then and they're put into a, a locker, a frozen, a freezing locker, because that was another thing around here is that there was no place to put the numerous numbers of bodies that were coming in. I live on the west side of Albuquerque here, and so the reservation is even further west than me, but I seem to be right in line with a line of helicopters and airplanes that would come into Albuquerque. And there, I knew the general flow of it. And a lot of times it was military ones that would fly around, but they're usually not flying like straight from Gallup to the UNMH. They, they're flying east, west, north, south. But I noticed that when COVID was at its peak, there would be sometimes four or five helicopter runs coming from the reservation straight into the two hospitals that we have here in town. And you knew that when, a, when someone was flying over, you knew that the, they were a COVID case that was very severe. And that, that was a constant reminder that I would, every time I seen that helicopter go over, I would just stop for a minute and just send a prayer to that person in that. I would send a prayer to that, that team that's flying there, taking care of that person, and also send a prayer to the family who had to let that, that family member go and the helicopter to the hospital. Because that's just a, the separation of that. It's just so traumatic for people. <clears throat> it's gonna take a lot of time to get over this. And it's not going to be easy, he says. It's gonna take some time in their community. Um, I didn't write this down, but in another conversation with Rob, he says during this time, he was he did um, be, because funerals are so social distance, hardly anybody could attend, and and the city was very stern about that. So a maximum number of people that could go to the grave site would be about ten. So no one else could make a trip there. Uh, so he he performed 17 COVID-related deaths just in his community alone. 
So you can just imagine how other pastors throughout every community around had to do a similar thing. So it has really been very stressful. But they were able to work and they, just like Ty and his ministry, they were able to work and help the families with food and with resources and help them along the way. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> One thing, the, a big thing, and, and I have a son who is a, a junior in high school, and I'll tell you, it is hard. Uh, school, uh, you're growing up, you don't think too much about it because we didn't have COVID, but there's a lot of interaction. There's a lot of socialization. There's a lot of friendship building and hanging out and doing these kind of things. And when COVID came, it was just nothing. So these kids all across town, they're communicating by, you know, their phones, but there's the, there's this personal contact that is so healthy that they weren't getting. And a lot of depression, even with my son getting, and feeling really down, and then not going to school, uh, and everybody's getting issued computers to finish school. And he was, he was lucky. We, we have a home here in Albuquerque where we have good service. And I, and because my wife is, uh, that was the reason I came on a little late today because my wife has just finished her last final for law school. And we had a hooding ceremony tonight. And I came directly from that to here and Saturday morning, she'll, she'll receive her degree for her law degree here from the U university of New Mexico law school. But education has been hard. All her classes at school were canceled, and she had to do the rest of her year since, since March all online. And then my son, too, has been able to do. And he's very, he's, he's very bright. So he was able to keep up his grades on, by using the computer at home. And then disciplined enough to sit there and have good connection, have good reception and good broadband and all these technical words that you need to have computers going like we're having right now. But <clears throat> let's just walk onto the reservation a little bit. And Kay, you're in, you're in New Mexico where we already have a 50% dropout rate. And your city probably doesn't have something like that. But here in New Mexico, it's, it's very low. Albuquerque city limits here as a 50% dropout rate. So now compound that with you're not able to go to school. And the only way you're able to go to school is if you get the computer out and you type in and you log in. But the only thing you have to have, is you have to have a good connection to a tower. And if you don't have that, you can't connect. So you have all these students now who are failing with a 50% dropout rate. And now you're telling that student, say, your grades are so low that for you to graduate, you have to take that grade over again. How many of them you think are going to go back and take that class over again? I think our dropout rate is going to soar. We're going to go through a time here of, you know, I know Jill here is an educator, and you can imagine the need that we're going to have here now with education. So that has been a big thing. The schools have failed to take the next, <laughs> the next year is going to be a big, a big to-do list of making things right. Well, that was Rob McIntosh from Church Rob. Now the next one, let me grab a drink here. The next one here is a um, uh, United Methodist pastor, a Native American pastor who has been assigned to the Four Corners Navajo Mission up here. And her name is uh, Reverend Tweedy Sombrero. And uh, she's taken on responsibility, like many other directors before her here, to do some organization with this area where we, at one time, we had over, uh, I think it was 15 uh, Native American Navajo uh, United Methodist ministries out there. Uh, today, um, there are several left from that, uh, but there are really only three active United Methodist missions now. Uh, it's, it's nothing to put a feather in your cap about anymore. It's, it's declining. It's hard to keep them going, 
the other missions that are there are, are very they're very active but they're they're on the side of the Pentecostal line so they we're trying to <clears throat> work on that together but uh, Tweety Sombrero I called her um, and she has relatives in Arizona and New Mexico as well and so she shared with me some of the things that she says so the the Navajo people didn't understand at the beginning here what social distance was and how important it was it, social distance was just something that uh, was very foreign uh, they're very social so handshaking was a very a big thing family gatherings and ceremonies they have all kinds of different kinds of ceremonies that take place here uh, we were able to go to one just recently but everyone that went to the ceremony had already been vaccinated so we were able to go to it's called the kenata it's a it's a young girls pu puberty ceremony and it lasts four days but preparation starts three days before that so a whole week time we were involved in a ceremony for this young young uh, lady and it was done in a hogan it's done with a lot of tradition and there's a lot of socialization that took place there so with that uh, a lot of the ceremonies that took place were all postponed they're waiting for a better time so she said that that's going to be one of the things that is going to have to play catch up on one pastor in the area his name is reverend norman He's a, a Navajo minister out there, but he has done many. I didn't. She didn't say how many funerals, but she has done many funerals for the Native community in that area. Not only from their congregation, but from the. He's like a, the chaplain for the whole community. People call on him like they call on me to do different things, to visit people in the hospital, to do funerals and weddings. She herself, she said she had to go back to Arizona with her family, and she has had four me members of her family pass away. But the Navajos, here we go again, she said, and you heard it, the Navajo, Navajos, they have this thing about death. Uh, you don't see many of them doing wills, preparing for death, talking about death, and saying, got to get this done before you know, I, I die, and you know, uh, going to do retirement and before I die, uh, none of that kind of conversation happens. And, and uh, even with my mother-in-law here, it was hard to get her and, and uh, my father-in-law to bring those kind of the things host, out. The host just unmuted everybody, so I got to get going. I'll talk to you later. All right, go back. Somebody want in? Okay, yeah, she says... <clears throat> The other tragic thing about was the number of bodies. You, you don't probably see them as much in your area uh, because you go to the hospital and then that's the last you see of them until maybe you do see part of a funeral. But out here, the bodies were done in those refrigerated units and uh, she called them shacks. She said they would put these all the bodies that they had in shacks. And it, it's just so heart-wrenching that when you leave your family member at the hospital and they don't come home, they go in a zip bag and then they go inside a freezer until a time when we can, you know, have time to put them in, in with it into the ground. But that was a big thing that was very strange for them, and they just could not understand why freezers and the bodies had to be stacked up just so, you know, like they were. Also, uh, another big thing that she says is the, the, the high rise and the, 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 the cases that came around is because in your home, you have no problem with running water, paper towels and clean towels. Uh, when you're in an area where there is no running water and there is no electricity and there, you know, your families are living close together, that's that's a big issue. When you have to drive, you know, maybe 10, 15 miles to go fill up your big water container and take it back to your area just so you have water to, to use for, you know, food and for, <clears throat> for washing and that, you know, that's the life out here. And it's, it's really hard. It's hard for the people. 
uh, one thing that she said and some of her family members made mention to is that they, they found elders that were not being cared for, that were trying to walk to town to get the things that they needed. And if you're older like I am, and you know, I have, I'm, I'm not even that old. I'm 60, 64 years old. I'm already taking four medications and, you know, one of them, babe, a baby aspirin. But, you know, but if you're older than that and you have, you know, you got six, seven medications that you got to take and the, the city's locked down, you're desperate. So these elders were walking to town to try to get the resources that they needed. And they were finding them alongside the road dehydrated, weary and tired and not able to walk anymore. So that was a, a big thing that she, you know, people would stop and help them then. And they, you know, it's dangerous to pick up somebody. You don't know if they got COVID. And so masks are hard to get. It may not be hard for you. You can go to Walgreens anywhere there and you can pick up any, any amount that you want. But when you're out on the reservation, You'll, you'll have a bandana around your face or a shirt or some kind of cloth. That, you know, the, it's just not ex you know, readily available to anybody out there. The medical staff in, in the Shiprock area was just overwhelmed. The overwhelmed, working 12-hour shifts. Um, where she was there is that they were able to open up the dorms of a small little uh, boarding school college and they were able to uh, open it up so that the staff didn't have to go home every time because they were working such great hours that they were able to go to this dorm and spend the night there. And that they've supplied food for them and they supplied you know, water and area for them to, to change and, and relax because they went back again and they did another 12 hour shift. And that was just constant around here. So they was very weary. <clears throat> So the nurses, they were able to find uh, good places to, to bed down and take that, <clears throat> take good rest. But they, alongside that, it's been a long time now that since we've been in COVID here, some 15 months now. Uh, so school supplies, there's still a need for school supplies. That's still going to be an issue out there is that school kids are going to be way behind. There were 22 chapter houses on the reservation, and they all got involved in helping the students get what they needed for school. And here's another thing you probably don't think of in your big city, is that a lot of these places out here have animals. You know, you talk about the sheep, and you eat the sheep, you make the wool, and you make the nice rugs and blankets that they have out here. But those animals also need food. So the resources that came in from many areas around and I don't know how much the Methodist Church was involved in the resourcing out there, but livestock needed food. They were able to give dog food and cat food and litter. And you wouldn't think of it, but chickens also have to have food. So they had all those kind of resources for people who had you know, small farms. They were able to have a Christmas for the kids. Donations came in by the droves and they were able to give Christmas gifts out to the kids that where the families weren't able to go into the towns to, to shop anymore. Uh, last thing here is that in the future here, uh, they believe things are going to change. They believe that, uh, you know, that people are going to take more seriously the need for water on the reservation and the need for internet connections. They think that that's going to be a, you know, a big priority. I hope that it doesn't get forgotten. I'm so familiar with people forgetting about ministry. I've tried, this is my fourth time trying to start a ministry here in Albuquerque. And I call it administrative memory. As soon as the DS changes or your pastor changes, and we know that in a Methodist church that happens very often. We got this thing called the itinerant system. So three to four years, you're, you're, you're bound to get another pastor. And so I would, um, as a trans transition over here to ministries, native ministries in the Southwest, not only on the reservation, but also in the urban settings, uh, there's a need for ministries here. Let me take another drink. How am I doing for time, Dick?
Okay, I'm, I'm, our, uh, our timeline, we go to 8.30, it's about co a quarter after. And uh, you had the third section uh, where we were going to be talking about ministries of support. And I believe that you have blended in some of your uh, comments on, uh, on support ministries. So yeah. I think you can uh, just, you just continue. And uh, I would like to uh, request uh, you to, in as we get closer to uh, our time of adjournment, uh, that you offer a, a prayer for healing. Because so many of the things that you've talked about uh, that families are, uh, are suffering from COVID are also the kinds of things that families and communities suffer from uh, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. So we are uh, we have communities that are, uh, are are suffering from multiple things. So that healing prayer would be very welcome. All right, and then um, should I break in between now to talk uh, and okay. then start up? Okay. Uh, I know we want Q and A, right? Uh, I think what we what we said we would do if we ran short of time, uh, we may not get to be able to uh, uh, to respond to individual questions. But any individual question we have, we'll provide those in in writing. Okay. Uh, to the individuals, and while we have our resource people, I would like to have you just continue. All right, great. I'll I'll, I'll transition over and talk about native ministries out here in. in I've been called back in 1988, got my call to ministry in a small church in Kuwait in Michigan. It's up there by Traverse City. Uh, during that time, I was the only, I was the youngest person in, in the place. Everyone ahead of me looked like I do now with gray hair. And I distinctly heard a voice say, while well, I was sitting seven rows back, and said, who is going to take their places? And at that time, I said, I am. And I didn't realize that I said it out loud and everybody turned and looked at me. And from that point on, they prayed over me and I started my journey in, in native ministry in 1988. Uh, very young and very uh, energetic and ready to, ready to go. Uh, so from that point on, my ministry wasn't uh, the typical kind of ministry that you would, you would think uh, in direction. I didn't go to Bible college. Uh, God called me to get back into school and study about the people that I was to meet and reach. And that was to understand the culture, the language, the traditions of the Native American people of the Great Lakes area. So from that, that led me into looking at the churches that were in the area. And at the time, we had 10 Indian missions in in Michigan with the United Methodist Church. And uh, that's a lot of churches for one state to have because you can go to other states and you don't see that that number of United Methodist Native American missions around. Uh, but the thing is, there just wasn't the pastors to fill them anymore. In the early years, there was some pastors, young young men who grew, grew old. And then, uh, then when they left, uh, it was left up to the conferences to fill those positions, and they usually uh, ended up with a, a white pastor from the s nearby city also helping the pastor at, and pastoring the church on, on the uh, usually a settlement or native community. But from that <clears throat> from that time, I felt felt the need, and I got this calling that Native American people can worship God the way God created them. And that led me into my master's and my doctoral work at looking and studying the history of how of the, the history, the church history that we understand now, that uh, the white Western colonized approach to ministry has been the only way that Native American people have ever had the chance to hear about the gospel. They have never had the chance to see it and hear it from any other voice. It's always been from a European, white, Western, colonized approach. And we all, we all worship that way now. Most all of us who go to a church, that is a white, Western, colonized approach. And that same approach was the approach that was used to reach the Native American in North America and Canada. And I found 
while starting a church in Grand Rapids in 1996, that if you did it differently, you could still have positive results in meeting Native people's needs to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. So from that time, that ministry was called All Tribes Gathering. And it was designed from the very beginning to be these five things. It had to be, it had to look, sound, smell, taste, and feel Native. You know, that's contrary to the sign of, it had to look, sound, smell, taste, and look, white Western colonized approach to ministry. Uh, so being sensitive to ministry, and my degree is called, uh, I'm a missiologist. So mission theology was a way that I, I was able to direct my studies. And now that's what I'm doing here in Albuquerque as well now, is starting a church to reach the, the largest population. <laughs> We're, it's a mission field. Uh, the statistics, here's where I'll share. The only statistics that I'm going to share is that it's it said that 75% of Native American people live in the urban settings. You know, that leaves 25% of Native American people live on reservations and settlements. And so where does the most work happen? The most work and missionary and uh, tours and mission trips all take place on the reservations where the minority of Native American people are. And also where the where the most over evangelized, missionized, and vacation Bible schooled uh, happens is on the reservation. They got some communities that will have four vacation Bible schools in one summer. And the same kids, you know, go up and get the lollipop and they, you know, accept Christ at every, all four of them. So, my call has been to reach the majority of the Native American population that live in the urban settings. And that's where the least amount of work is being done in the Native American ministry setting. Just to throw out, and I know many of you Methodists are going to go like gasp when you hear this, that Albuquerque, New Mexico, city limits, has never had a ministry or an active congregation to Native Americans in Albuquerque city limits, ever. They have ministries of helps, of work, of food, of clothing, of housing, but they have never had an active congregation here in Albuquerque. So about a year ago, me and a couple people got together and we put together a proposal to give to the Methodist Church to see if they would back us to do this ministry we're doing. And we had already been meeting for three and a half years to that point, and we have been doing it in a culturally sensitive approach to ministry. So from that time, I'd met with the New Church Development Committee, the DS, the provost, and through uh, some talks with them, they approved me as, as of November 1st to be the pastor of a new church start here in Albuquerque, we call the Good Medicine Way. And we're on Facebook. You can check us out. And also check out my Facebook too, Casey Church. And you'll see the things that I've been involved in and still involved in. But Native Ministries out here in the Southwest, there is a great need. There's a great need to go onto the reservations and help them see that they're not reaching the, the Native people that uh, God, I believe God would want us to reach. Um, what they are reaching is providing a ministry for the uh, small huddle of Native Christians that continue to sit in their little churches and their little pews, and they have this thing called a holy huddle. Uh, they're not very outreach reaching, uh, even to their own communities. I imagine some of you, you know the feeling. Uh, as long as they can get together in your own little setting, you're happy. But uh, ask them to do anything other than that, you know, that's the pastor's job, they say. But uh, a lot of times in the Methodist church, I know that we're, we're good givers. And a lot of times we'll give to organizational funding so that other people can do the ministry that each and every one of us should be doing that I believe should be done.
we should all be the hands and feet and mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ to the world. So here in Albuquerque, we have this mission that's um, going to be a new start here, and we hope to have a launch by the late July, maybe August. And from that, uh, we'll see where it goes. It's an experiment because it's never been done here in Albuquerque. And I have an experience in church planting in other areas, but that's going to happen. Uh, the ministries that, uh, that do happen in the Southwest, and here particularly in Albuquerque, we have a Nazarene church, we have an Assembly of God church, and they are very, uh, they have been, this, I've been coming out here for some 45 years, and the same church that, uh, the Nazarene church that my wife grew up in, it is the same size as when I visited them 45 years ago. Uh, there has been uh, a couple of young men and men have left for ministry, but are uh, have fallen and gone back and to work, but not in ministry anymore. So there is quite a need still for Native ministries. And uh, I hate to say it, but the United Methodist Church does not know how to create Native American leadership because we want it to be done on the white Western colonized approach to ministry. And my approach to ministry is to create leadership from a Native American perspective and a culturally sensitive approach to ministry. And it is working. I have five leaders in my, in my ministry right here in Albuquerque. One of them that would like to go on and become a local licensed minister. I have a, have a music minister that has come along. I have two Navajo youth that are working with InterVarsity and they are doing really well. So there's that need is still still there. <clears throat> My approach doing ministry, like I said, is very uh, culturally sensitive. The word that is you know, floating around is called contextual. We're doing it in the context of the Native American mindset of traditions and culture and values, rather than uh, doing it from a white Western. The the only way that churches have ever been planted in the Native American world is to take the model from the mother church, the white mother church, and take a sprout out of that, repot it there, and put that pot inside the community so you have an exact replica of the mother church. So every song, every message, and the way of doing church is exactly the same as it's done in the white church when it needs to be done from the Native American context in my approach to ministry. You know, I, I don't put it down because that way of ministering helped reach me and bring me to faith. So it is going to be uh, a way that uh, it's going to take time to develop. So, Dick, are we at a point? Thank you. We're, uh, we're boy, we're closing in on 8.30 real quick. Okay, so, let's, let's uh, go to the questions now, and I, I, I don't want to just take up my time. And okay, uh, well, we, we promised that if we ran, uh, we, if we ran short, we would provide written answers, and that's that's what we'll do tonight. I would like to uh, express our sincere and grateful appreciation to you and Raggy for the, uh, you know, for the, uh, the wonderful information. And especially the information that is coming from communities and not the kinds of uh, things that we read in the papers or even hear on the news. And, uh, and that part of the message is, is, is very important. Uh, we want to thank the, our, our planning committee and all those that uh, took the time tonight to, to participate with, uh, you know, with our, uh, our webinar. And we thank you for the for the information and for pointing in some directions where we can see that uh, that we can be of service and we can aim our personal or perhaps our congregations or our ministries to areas where we can we can help. Uh, in as we close now, uh, Casey, if you could lead us in uh, in a prayer of of healing and direction. And, uh, and that will, when, when you finish, that will conclude our webinar for this evening. All right. Well, I'm going to put most of your Methodists out of your comfort zones, and I would like you to raise your hands. 
you know, if you want to take yourself off a screen because you don't want anybody to think you're a charismatic or something, that's okay. But uh, raise your hands to our creator. And just say, Father God, I just pray over this group here that words of wisdom and knowledge that came from Reggie and myself, and we go by the guidance that you have given us and the words to say that we want, want to influence the work among Native communities. We want missing and murdered Indigenous women to take seriously, that it would come to an end and be curtailed as much as possible, that many avenues that would stop this, this tragedy that's happening among our, our young, young ladies and women and pray that you will give us guidance in that. If we're not able to join in with our, with our feet and our hands and our voices, let us, with our pocketbook, be able to share into agencies that do. We pray that you, these churches that um, have some resources can put it into the hands that can save lives. We pray, Lord, also for the Native ministries in this area that are need your help. There's just not enough work to be done, being done. And pray that, you know, the statistics that I've heard over the years is just more than 90% of the Native population in the United States and Canada are unreached or do not have a faith in Jesus Christ. So any missionary agency, Lord, would call that a mission field. I pray that you will just listen as we raise our hands to you and we just give this all over to you. In the name of Jesus, we ask this. Amen.